So, uh, still AP Calc, still September 7th. Let's go. Uh, here's what we're going to learn. All right, here's our definition of a derivative. Now, time to explain what it means. All right, let's start with the fact that we have some function. Let's call that function f of x. All right? Now, what we would like to do is talk about the slope of that function at a particular point. Talk about the slope of the function at a particular point. Let's talk about that point being right here at x. Right? Now, we don't know how to draw or calculate a slope except from the idea of rise and run. This thing is curvy. The slope is changing. Here, the slope is 0. Here, the slope is 0. Here, from here to here, the slope is, the line is taking all different kinds of slopes on. The slope is constantly changing. But we can't figure that out, that slope, with our normal set of tools. We could draw a rise and a run. I'll drive, draw a little bit of rise. A little bit of, sorry, a little bit of run, a little bit of rise, okay? I'm going to label these things, by the way. This rise, sorry, this run, I'm going to call H. The run, based on what we've seen so far, can actually be calculated. this rise part? Well, we've got to calculate that distance there. Perfectly up and down. I'd say we do it by subtracting the two y values. This point right here was the point x comma, oh, what's the y value for that, for that point? f of x, I would call it, the value of the function at the point x, over here we've got a new point, the one that we're going to use for, for estimating the slope. Now we're no longer at x, we've moved h over. second coordinate. Now, if I use the standard, the standard difference of y's divided by difference of x's for our slope equation, what we end up getting in the, well, let's say the in the bottom, is that we get x plus h minus x. There's a difference in x values. And I'm using the second coordinate as my uh, my, my first pair. Up on the top, we got a difference of y values. So there is our, well, let's call this the slope estimate. So far so good? It almost starts to look like that thing that's in the box. What's, what's, what's different? Well, the, the x's in the bottom should cancel. 
So we end up getting f of x plus h on the top minus f of x. And then these two cancel, leaving us just the h. And that's still very, very good. That almost looks like what's listed in the box. But we got some other things going on. Limits. Now, what this will do, if x is large, or sorry, if h is large, it's going to give us the blue this one. It's going to give us the slope between these two points. Now, that particular kind of slope has a, has a special name. It's called the secant slope. It's a secant line. It's a line that touches a curve twice. And while that blue line's slope is useful for estimating the value of the slope at x, that estimate could be made better by making h smaller. How small? Infinitely small. Infinitesimal. Infinitely small. I think that's a contradiction. Infinitesimally small. Infinite means really, really large. So infinitely small means a really large small number. Or a really small large number. I can't, I can't tell. We've got infinitesimally small. Really, really small. Calculus small. So while this gives us an estimate of the slope at x, taking the limit as h approaches 0 of f of x plus h minus f of x over h gives us exactly the slope. Not an estimate. As h approaches a 0, that expression is exactly the slope. No longer a secant line slope. It gives us now the tangent. tangent line slope, the slope at that point. Now, since it, we found the slope in looking at the function f, we say that we have derived this new function based on f. And so we're going to give this a name that's based on f as well. We're going to call it f prime because it was derived from f. It came from f. That's the meaning of that mumbo-jumbo on the top of the screen. Now, the warning. Underlined in red. Provided that the limit exists. And that's what you needed to review before you came into class today. What does it mean that a limit exists? Under what circumstance would we say a limit doesn't exist? Yes? Infinite discontinuity. An infinite discontinuity. Come and draw an infinite discontinuity. By the way, I don't use that expression, but you draw it, and then I'll tell you what I call it. write some good notation about limits. Okay? Please, no, you, you get the pen, you can write. Let's write the limit somewhere up top. We're going to write three things here. Okay? Somewhere up top. The limit. Oh, I am. Oh, like actually write the word limit. Actually write the word, what we use for the word limit. L I am. Okay. Okay, here's how this board works. You need to touch it in one and only one place at a time. I, I figured Other, that. Otherwise, what it does is it takes the average, takes the midpoint of what you do. Ready? Watch this. See this? That's kind of cool. Kind of cool. It's kind of frustrating because if you use your hand to guide where your pen goes, 
It gets very frustrating. Okay, so lim, L-I-M. Okay, we use lowercase l's in this, cl in this class for limit, but that don't worry, it's a don't worry, we'll, we'll. It doesn't like me at all. What? <laughs> I don't worry about it either. Don't worry about it. All right, lim, as x approaches zero. Like, oh. As x approaches zero. Okay, and now this is something you may not remember. From the left. From the left? It's minus. Minus, good. Of f of x. Excellent. We always take the limit of something. We never say limit equals, limit of something equals. Equals. And in this case, he says it's equal to, according to that drawing, infinity. infinity. Great. Write it down. Okay, limit as x approaches from the right side, please. Of f of x. It, it's messing with me again. What is it equal, in that, in, according to his drawing? Negative infinity. Negative infinity. Write it down. Great. Last statement. The limit as x approaches zero. Without any special extra marks. Should I write that? Yes, please. Of f of x. Does not exist. And we use the three letter expression. DNE. 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 We say if the two one sided limits don't agree, Function, the, the, the limit does not exist. Okay, great. So there's one instance in which the limit does not exist. Are there any other situations where the limit does not exist? You got it? Do you want to use red? Do you want to use red? Okay. Okay. Let's call this point. Let's give this value A. So we have a reference point. Okay. So tell me about this, Mr. Demery. It's a point discontinuity. It's a point discontinuity. That is correct. It's a point discontinuity. We say that that function is discontinuous at A. It is. It is. Great. Let's talk about limits, though. How about the limit? Let's call this line that he drew, that he, that he drew, let's call it function X, or function F, because it's our favorite function. Uh, it's for Fedor. Yep. No. Limit as X approaches A. No, okay, we'll do it from the left, sure. All right, uh, by the way, let's just make a little marker here. Let's assume that this then matches up to that value B. All right, continue. The limit as X approaches A from the left of F of X is equal to? B. Agreement? Argument? We good there? Okay. Sure. B. Okay. I, I would like a, like a couple of equal signs in there too, just for good measure. Yep. Yep. Great. Let's do it the limit without any special extra symbols. The limit as x approaches A. Agreement? No. no. Disagreement? Since it's a point discontinuity, the limit is the same uh, approaching A from either side. Therefore, the limit agrees and does exist. I agree with Mr. Demery. 
Mr. Reesky. Okay, so let's put the right answer in. What is it? B. B. Okay, so if the right hand limit and the left hand limit agree, we say the limit does exist and it's equal to the values that. Okay. All right, so great. Good, Mr. Demery, you were right. F is discontinuous at x equal a. All right. All right. And in part of chapter two, you actually could explain why is it discontinuous. There's three things that have to be true for a function to be dis to to be continuous at a point. One, the limit as x approaches a of f of x. has to exist to f of a must exist and three the limit as x approaches a of f of x has to actually equal to f of a which things of this fails why is this dis why is this discontinuous F of A doesn't exist. Because F of A doesn't exist. Well, what if I say, yes, it does, it exists, it's right there. F of A now exists. Now which part does it fail on? The limit doesn't equal F of A. The limit doesn't equal F of A. There we go. So, good review for discontinuity, but in this case, this is a case, this is a situation where the limit does exist. Yes? I do know the last one. Because because the two the right hand limit and the left hand limit didn't agree. Yeah. All right. Any other any other uh, things that we could do to show a limit not existing? Yeah. I think I think I mean we have the infinite one. But the but the in the other cases a limit does exist. It's just discontinuous. Right. The limit the limit exists here everywhere. Okay. Um, just draw. Let's just draw one more, and then this is. When I think of a jump discontinuity, in this case, the limit does not exist at, okay, we'll call it A. You agree there? Yeah. Yeah. Does the right, does the right hand limit exist? Yeah. Yes. Sure. Let's call it B. Does the left hand limit, sorry, the left hand limit is B. The limit as X approaches A from the left. B, the limit as x approaches a from the positive side, from the right of f of x is equal to, I don't know, want to give it a name? B. And we say that the limit at f, the limit as x approaches a does not exist, does not exist because we would say b and c are not equal. equal. All right, so there's our review of limits. And continuity. All right. Let's come to a, a quick decision here. It says here that the domain of f, remember, that's the function derived from the original function, the function that will tell us the tangent line slope, sometimes also referred to as the instantaneous slope, that the domain of this f prime function may be smaller than the function itself. If f prime exists, we say that f has a derivative or is differentiable at that value. Let's draw some pictures. I'm going to draw a picture of a function f. So here's my axes. And this is going to be a very famous function called its name. Value. The absolute value. So this is y is equal to absolute value x. Okay, oh, let's call that f of x. All right? So this is the graph of y equal f of x. But well, what does the graph of f prime look like? Now, f prime is a function that 
turn the slope at a particular point. So if I said, here I am over at negative 3, you could then tell me, what is the slope of the graph when x is negative 3? 1. 1? Negative 1. Negative one, yeah. Roberto, you okay with that? Yeah. Okay, it's negative one. So if I wanted to graph the function f prime, the slope at that point, I would be down here at negative one and I'd put a little dot there. Okay? Well, what about at negative two? Same, Same thing? Yeah. And at negative one? Negative one. So negative one? Now let me, for my own purposes, Let's jump over to where x is equal to 1. What's the slope of f of x when x is 1? Positive 1. And at 2? 1. And at 3? 1. OK. So what I have is a bunch of points here. And I think it's pretty clear that all those are going to go there. And all these are going to go here. I want to talk about what happens at 0, though. Yeah. For the left hand line at uh, negative one, there will be an open dot on the axis. For the top one, there will be another open, and there will be a point at zero, zero. Okay, so you're saying that the limit of the slope equation, in other words, as I get closer and closer here, that limit is going to be one, 1, 1, 1, all those slopes are 1 all the way down the line. And if I keep on going from this direction, they're always 1. The derivative, which is a limit, on the right-hand side is going to be all 1s. But if I go down this way, it's negative 1, negative 1, negative 1, negative 1, negative 1. The limits, if I come down this way, are all negative 1. Yes, sir. Yes. And what we found was if those two limits don't agree, then we say the overall limit does not exist. Let me write it in symbols. The limit as h approaches 0 from the positive side of f of 0 plus h minus f of 0 over h. By the way, I would have a, this, this has got a special name. Man, I don't know, I won't give it the name. As I say, this is, this is finding out the slope at zero as we come in this way. Is equal to one. The limit as h approaches zero from the, mi from the minus side equal to negative 1. And as, as we saw before, when we don't have a right-hand side and left-hand side limit agree, we say the limit it doesn't exist. exist. So we would say this is DNE. But what is this? What is the special name I would give to that big piece of mathematical jargon? F and zero. Well, sorry, I mean, definition, right? F prime of x is the limit as x approaches zero. Sorry. Put that down. One. The limit as h approaches 0 of f of x plus h minus f of x all over h. So this is f prime of x, and x occurs there and there. This would have to be f prime of 0, because 0 is occurring there and there. f prime of 0. OK, so in the case of the, in the case of the absolute value function, limits don't agree. Derivative doesn't exist. 
Now, this function, its domain is all real numbers. The function f, which is the absolute value function, is all real numbers. This function, its domain, is smaller. It lacks zero. Its domain is smaller. All right. I think we've done enough on that one. All right. Let's go back. Let's go back to our definition, and I'd like to calculate what is the derivative of f of x is equal to x cubed. Okay, so we start with what's the definition? What's the definition of derivative? Limit of f prime of x is equal to the limit, the limit as, as, limit as h approaches zero of f of x plus h minus f of x minus f of x h all over h. Okay, now let's start replacing. The limit as h approaches 0. What is f of x plus h if f of x is x cubed? I think that means every place I see an x in my original definition, I replace it with x plus h. I think this transforms into x plus h cubed. And I think this gets replaced with h cubed. H cubed. And I'm going to divide all of this by h. Now, we've been looking and talking about limits graphically to start out with. Now I want to talk about limits algebraically. If I go to my calculator and I plug in 0 here, here, and here, it go boom. It explodes. It breaks the laws. What law does it break? Can't divide by 0. Well, Chuck Norris can divide by 0, but no one else can divide by 0. You know about Chuck Norris, right? Yes. He counted to infinity. Twice. All right. So, with a plain old plug and chug, this blows up. But maybe we can get lucky. And by the way, on the definition of der derivatives, we always get lucky. It always works out if the derivative exists. We are going to work on this algebraically, and maybe we'll get a cancellation. Maybe that h will go away. It won't break the law. Let's expand and see what we get. The limit as h approaches 0. Let's expand out. What is x plus h quantity cubed? Starts with x cubed. Starts with x cubed. Very good. I believe the expansion is x cubed plus 3x squared h plus 3xh squared plus h cubed. Yep. How did he do that? Pascal's triangle. Pascal's triangle showed the coefficients of binomial expansions. Other way you could have done that, of course, you could have said x plus, or you could have said x plus h squared times x plus h. This is x squared plus 2xh plus h squared. And then multiply this by x plus h. x times x is x cubed. x times that is 2x squared h. x times that is xh squared. And then do the same with the h's. And we end up getting uh, 2x squared h plus To, what was I screwed it up? Yeah, I did. Sorry. It's x squared h and then plus 2xh squared plus h cubed. And you can see that it all adds up to what I wrote the first time. 
All right, so there's the expansion of x plus h cubed. Minus h cubed all over h. Still can't plug and chug yet. Yeah, Vic? Yeah, no, it's minus f of h. Is this x? Is it, oh, is it x? Yeah. So I wrote down the definition and I got it wrong, and you didn't stop me. This is a serious error because I'm going to make mistakes like that all the time. I don't use them on purpose. So that's x, and that's x there. Is that right, Vicki? I think so. Here, let me, uh, let me do it in green. Makes it show up a little bit better. Is that better? Yeah. All right, let's see where that leads us. Do I have it right in the notes earlier? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Woo. All right, so when we, when we um, make that change, what happens? The x cubed and the minus x cubed cancel. Okay, so those two cancel. Of the remaining terms in here, all of them have an H in them. So we're going to pull the H out. Or we're going to get the H out. All right. Which leaves us 3X squared plus 3XH plus H squared. And that's all over H. Is that good? Now what? These two H's cancel. Very good, zero. All right, now what? Because now we can plug it in and it no go boom. It doesn't explode. It doesn't break the law. We can officially do the plug and chug now because we break no laws. And if we put a zero in here and here, three x squared. the only thing left over is 3x squared. And indeed, we say that 3x squared is the derivative function of the function x cubed. Mr. Demery, you wouldn't do it this way, would you? No. no. There is a shortcut. Not today, though. No, no, no. Uh, <laughs> that's so much easier. Oh, uh, with, within two more sections. Within two more sections. All right. Mr. Can yeah, I can use the shortcut on the You can use the show you can use the shortcut to confirm your answer is correct in the short term. It's only going to be for a couple of it's only going to be a couple of sections and what we're doing is we're, we're building up a set of experience because the college board will write sneaky problems to use the definition of the derivative instead of the derivative itself. The shortcuts. And if you don't know the definition and this is our only time to really get it down, you're going to miss those questions. We don't want to miss those questions. All right, so let's go on. There's an alternate definition of derivative that sometimes works out a little bit more nicely. All right? And that is that the derivative at the point A, the derivative of the function at x equal A, shorthanded f prime of A, can also be written as the limit as x approaches A of f of x minus f of A over x minus A. Can you really see that rise over run? The, two, the difference of those two f's is going to be your rise. The x minus a is really your run. If I had to draw a picture, if I had to draw a picture, here I am at a. Here's my function. Here is the point a comma f of a. And here is the point x comma f of x. And the, the rise portion of this is f of x minus f of a. And the run portion, portion of this is x minus a. And that expression, of course, is a great secant line estimate. But in order to turn it into a tangent line slope, we need those, the differences between a and x to be smaller and smaller. We talk about what happens as x approaches a. The, dis the distances get smaller and smaller. They get closer and closer. How close? Calculus close, infinitesimally close. So this is the estimate. If 
But what is the real value? Well, the real value is when x gets arbitrarily close to a, infinitesimally close to a. All right, so there's our definition. Sometimes the h definition worked out well. Sometimes this alternate definition works out well. When I mean work out well, I mean when we try to algebraically massage the limit, we get something that cancels out nicely. And I think we're going to get an opportunity to do that right now. I would like to find out what is the derivative of the square root function using this alternate definition. Uh, let's see if I can write this one down properly. Limit as x approaches a of f of x minus f of a over x minus a. So there's our definition. And that is equal to f prime at a. So let's, let's do some substitution. Every place I see an f, let's replace it with what the function is. Well, if our function is f of x is equal to x squared, what is f of x? A. Square root of? I said x squared, I meant x. What is f of a? Okay, and this is all over x minus a. Hey, can I just plug and chug every place I see an x, replace it with a, and everything's cool? I get a minus a in the bottom. Is that trombone sound? Explosion, yeah. All right, so this is no good. So what do I have to do? I've got to start massaging it. I've got to start making it do what I want it to do. <coughs> this requires, what is technically called a trick. What kind of trick? It's called the conjugate trick. All right. So let's apply the conjugate trick to this limit. In the conjugate trick, what we do when we see this expression, square root of x minus square root of a, we multiply it by its conjugate, which is the square root of x plus the square root of a. Now what ends up you know the rule, if I multiply it on the top of a fraction, I'm going to need to multiply, on the multiply it on the bottom. And we end up with the limit as x approaches a. Oh, let's expand this just for fun. The top is x, or x minus a. Okay, and you get that by going x, this times this. Square root of x times the square root of x is x. x. Square root of x times square root of a is square, square root of x. x. Square root of an x. Okay, and then over here would be what? Minus root x. Newton's like rolling over in his grave right now. Minus a. And then minus a. And this is all over x minus a quantity times the square root of x plus square root of x. Well, first of all, let's do some, uh, let me grab my red pen. Well, can I, Mr. Racy, what do you want me to do? Okay, well, you hit your hand up. Or you just scratch in the back of your head. Okay. We got some canceling? You see some canceling? Square root of x. The two, the two square root of x is canceled? Yes. Okay, they're gone. They are so gone. That leaves us what? The limit as x approaches a of x minus a over x minus a quantity times the square root of x plus square root of a. More canceling. More canceling? Sure. Sure. This thing here shows up exactly right there as well? Yep. yep. So it's gone. That leaves us the limit as x approaches.
approaches A of 1 over root X plus root A. Now, can we plug and chug without breaking the loss? Yes. Yes. Okay, Sarah, I you, okay, you may not present an answer with a radical in the denominator. That is a true statement. It's not illegal to have a radical in the denominator. It's not like a divided by zero. If you put in your calculator one by one divided by root two, guess what I'm going to say? Kiss kiss. But in formal mathematics, we like to present answers with rationalized denominators. And so it's an ask. I don't care. All right? I don't care if you rationalize the denominator or not in this class. You do know, need to know how to do it in case an answer is presented in that rationalized form. But I'm okay with that. All right. So what happens if we plug and chug? Replace every x with an a. Is that right? Yeah. And I end up getting 1 over root a plus root a. Two root a. One over two root, two root a. Okay, so by the way, we started over here, and we ended here. So f prime of a is equal to one over two root a. Now, may I ask the question, what is f prime of Oh, one. One half. How? Plug in one for the A. Oh, I take this thing and I plug it in for A. Every place I see an A, I take the thing that's in here and plug it in, and you get one half. Is that correct? Yeah. I like it. Now I'm going to ask a silly question. What's F prime of X? One over, one over two, two square, root square root x. Because the same rule applies. Take whatever's in here and replace it with where the a was, just like you did with one. So even though the definition, this alternate definition, is written as f prime of a, there's no reason why when we're all said and done, we can't translate that answer into f prime of x. All the same. All right? How are we doing on time? 11.55. 11.55, and we get out of here at 12.03. So 56. 56, okay, so we've got so seven, seven minutes. minutes. Okay, let's see, how, let's see how far we can get. Let's see how far we can get. All right, so a couple of other things to note here is that there's many different ways to say derivative. Don't write this down, it's all in your book. All right, so we talked about, you know, we have this function f, and we derive it and we get f prime. Well, what if the function is y is equal to x squared? When we derive it, uh, 2x. we get y prime. 2x. Uh, uh, <laughs> I'm just talking about what we can call that thing the derivative. Not what the derivative is, which is what you just did, Roberto. All right? OK, I'm just saying that the act of deriving the y function gives us a y prime. But we have all these other ways of calling it the derivative as well. dy dx. Now, I don't know why we don't say dy over dx, but we don't. This symbol, dy slash dx on the bottom, is just another way of saying the derivative function of y with respect to x. How is y changing as x changes, which is pretty much what we say is a slope. Now, if you're used to the definition of slope as delta y over delta x, we can see that this dy dx has that same kind of form. The only thing is, when we think of deltas, we think of big things. But when we think of dy and dx's, we think of really small movements, infinitesimal movements in the x direction, infinitesimal movements in the y direction. OK, and the last one, I'm going to skip this one. The last one I want to look at is this one, OK? I want to make a distinction about this particular notation. This is
is a verb. This is a noun. Hmm? English class here? Really? Yeah. Okay, dy dx is the derivative. It's a noun. It's a thing. But this particular notation, the d divided by the dx, I use that as the verb. It is the action of taking the derivative. Or in the case of, in the case of what Roberto just talked about in this particular problem, I start with, ah, can't write. I start with y is equal to x squared. I'm going to say, I'm going to take the derivative of both sides. The action of taking the derivative with respect to x of both sides. The action of taking the derivative of x squared. Now, Roberto, from a former life, I guess, because we haven't covered it in this class, says that this is 2x. The action of taking the derivative of y with respect to x gets us dy dx, or gets us y prime. So y prime, dy dx, they're the nouns. They're the thing, the derivative that happen. This is the action of taking the derivative. It's a very subtle distinction. Are you following me there? Okay. We'll leave it at that. We'll leave it at that. All right. Um, probably finish up on this slide. You may not be able to do all of your homework, but you'll be able to do most of your homework based on, on, this, on this last slide. All right. So here's a function, and or here's the graph of a function. One of the things. One of the things that happens all the time on the AP exam and will also likewise happen on my exam is that given a function, what does the graph of its derivative look like? Given a derivative function, what's the graph of the original function look like? Both of them are very typical AP problems. So let's do this one real quickly. Okay? I'm telling you that this is the function f. What does the function f prime look like? So we can talk about things like, what is the slope when x is 0? A. Well, it's at the point A. But what is the slope? 0. No. no what's up's going up. OK. Do you see how, for your enjoyment, they drew this line? That's called the tangent line. Oh. And the slope of the slope of a function at a point is that tangent line slope. So when you look at this tangent line, do you see the run and rise that they drew for you? Right. Yes, so you can figure it out. So you can figure it out. Okay. It, rise, it, it, it ran one, it rose four. four, it has the slope four. So you know what that means? If we're going to do the graph of f prime, when x is zero, the slope was 4. Now take a look at 1, at point B. Now you don't have to give me an exact value, but what kind of slope do you think it has at slope B? Imagine again drawing, drawing the tangent line through that. I don't know, it's already a guess. One. I say 1. 1? And positive, right? Because yeah. yeah. if I went over positively 1, I went up positively 1? Sure. So here I am at x is equal to 1, and I say, okay, great. We've got a slope of we've got a slope of 1 then. Okay, how about at 2? Um, zero. Zero. Because if I drew again, if I drew the tangent line through there, and because it says right next to it, slope zero. Alright. But we recognize horizontal lines as having a slope 0. So here I am when x is equal to 2, and I've got that, that point there. Okay. Now at 3, now they tell you the slope equals a negative 1, but can I just remind you? What happens when I draw the tangent line through, through d? Does it look like negative 1? Yeah. Sure it does. Okay, so your assignment is to get as much of 
what you have already been given to you done. We'll finish up this lecture tomorrow. Oh, no, no, no. Okay. All I have to do is I have to stop the recording first.